Okay, let's uh, start by considering the fish. The fish, like every other animal, needs to have oxygen as that final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain, which means they need oxygen to survive and to breathe. Unfortunately, they live in an aquatic environment and there's not as much oxygen dissolved in water as there is in air. So, uh, they've got a particular set of challenges for them. Um, fish respire or get oxygen from the environment using their gills. Now the gills sit sort of right behind their head on either side. These are highly branched, flattened, um, very thin feathery structures that provide lots of surface area for blood and water to come into contact. When we look at how the blood and water do come into contact behind, their, behind the head there at the gills, what we see is that water enters the fish through its mouth and is pushed out through two holes on either side of its head um, that allows water to move across the gills and out of the organism. So the water in this case is moving from head to tail in that particular direction. Conversely, the blood that's circulating through the fish's body and is coming into the gills is coming from the tail toward the head. So when they come into contact, the water is flowing toward the tail and the blood is flowing toward the head in the gills. Uh, these two currents are counter each other, so we call this a countercurrent situation. And what we're going to find is that that countercurrent situation is going to be critical for the fish's ability to extract a lot of oxygen from the environment. So before we get into the actual discussion of how this works, let's make sure we're all on the same page in terms of uh, the little icons and bits and pieces that I'm going to use in this explanation. So first of all, the pink or red arrow, that's going to equal the blood um, the blue arrow, that's going to be the current, the water current, and um, the dice here are all going to represent oxygen molecules. And uh, you can guess as to why the number two is turned up on all of those oxygen molecules. All right? And then, of course, the arrowhead is going to be pointing in the direction that um, the current is flowing. So fish use countercurrent exchange in order to extract as much oxygen from the water as they possibly can. Um, let's talk about why they do countercurrent exchange by first talking about why, why co-current exchange isn't a very good idea or isn't as effective. So in terms of countercurrent exchange in the fish, the blood is flowing towards the head through the gills and the water is passing from the head to the tail through the gills, so they're flowing in opposite directions. But what if the scenario was that the blood was flowing in the same direction as the water? Okay, so I want us to take a look here uh, at these two arrows. The blue arrow represents water, and the red arrow represents the blood. And so we're going to look at what happens during co-current exchange. In each case, we have dice on here that represent an oxygen molecule. You'll notice that there are more oxygen molecules in the water than there are in the blood because a fish's blood comes back to the gills from the body and it's been depleted of oxygen. It still has some, but not a lot. Now these actual numbers are totally made up, um, but they're, they're designed to, to demonstrate the principle. Okay, so if we look here during co-current exchange, here we see the water and the blood coming together for the first time. In the water, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven oxygen molecules, and in the blood that's running beside it, only one. All right, so that's a pretty strong gradient, right? Blood wants to flow down, its, or oxygen wants to flow down its concentration gradient, so it's going to flow from the, the water into the blood. So we'll move one oxygen in. Okay, this is co-current exchange, so they are going to continue to flow beside each other. Do, 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 do. All right, okay. 
So after a little time has passed, they're flowing beside each other. Uh, let's take a look here. Well, the blood in this area and the water in this area, there's still a gradient for oxygen to flow in. So we're going to move one of those oxygens over here. And this area of the water has just come into contact with this area of the blood. And there's a gradient for oxygen to flow in. So we are going to move one oxygen molecule in. Okay, great. We're going to allow some more time to pass. The uh, blood and the water flow past each other. Okay, then we're going to stop it. All right, let's take a look at the water and the blood in this area. Well, there's still a gradient. We have one, two, three, four, five here, one, two, three here. Okay, so we're going to move one of the oxygens down its concentration gradient into the blood. Let's look at this area right here. We have six and two, still a gradient for oxygen to flow into the blood. And so we will do that. And then this area of the water is coming in contact with the blood for the very first time. And you can see there's a very strong gradient here. So we're going to move an oxygen molecule over there. Great. Time's going to pass as these flow past each other. Da, 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 da. Right? Okay. All right. So let's look at this area of the water and this area of the blood that are running beside each other. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, oh, oh my. So there's no gradient there. Uh, so no oxygen will be removed from the water at this point. Okay, let's look here at this. These two are running side by side. We have one, two, three, four, five, and three. So, okay, good. We can move one oxygen molecule over there. How about this one right here? We have six, two over there. Well, there's more oxygen here than there, so oxygen will diffuse across into the blood. And finally, these guys are coming into contact for the first time. We have seven and one, so there's a pretty strong gradient. We'll move that in there. Great. Uh, but no oxygen was extracted here. Okay, so we're going to move along a little bit. They're co their, um, co or co current flow here. Let's stop this time. All right, here, well, still no gradient. Oh, now we have no gradient here, four and four. Here we still have a gradient, so I can move. I have five here, three here. I can move one of these oxygens over there. Great. And if I look here, I have six and two. Well, still more oxygen out here in the, in the blood in this area, or in the, in the water, so I can move that oxygen molecule into the blood. All right. Let's let some more time pass as these two currents flow beside each other. They flow for a while. All right. Let's stop. Take a look. Uh, at this point, there is no... Um, gradient. Um, we say this is equilibrated, right? So there's four here, four here. Uh, this is how equilibrated. Four here, four here, no gradient. Four here, four here. We still have one here. Uh, five oxygen molecules versus three, so we can move one of those across. All right? And then we move a little bit more. Time passes. Let's stop and take a look. Now, at this point, obviously, the blood and the water have equilibrated. There's no longer a gradient in um, after they've been passing along each other for this time. And the blood cannot extract any more oxygen from the water. It did manage to extract some oxygen, and that's great. The question is, can we do better? And what we find in countercurrent exchange is that, in fact, we can. Now let's imagine what happens when the two currents are flowing in opposite directions. So this is what happens in a fish. In a fish, the blood is flowing from the back of the animal toward the head through the gills, whereas the water it is, is sucking in and pushing out across the gills is moving from the head to the tail. So the two currents of the water and the blood are actually moving in opposite directions. Now what this means in a very general sense is that the blood is always encountering um, water that has more oxygen in it. Uh, it is technically fresher than it. But let's take a look at what that means at sort of a nuts and bolts level in terms of the movement of oxygen. So here we have our water again and our blood flowing in opposite directions. And what we're going to see is as they flow along, let's see here that this water first makes contact with this bit of blood. 
and we can see that there's a pretty strong grading here. We have eight of these dice here, and we have one oxygen molecule there. So we're going to have um, a single oxygen molecule, for example, diffuse into the blood there. Great. Now we're going to have the blood flow just a little bit more. Now it's aligned slightly differently. Uh, let's take a look. This, pack, this area of the blood is encountering this area of the water. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's two. So obviously there is a gradient for water to move into um, the blood there. And likewise, there is a gradient for water to move, or oxygen to move into the blood from here. Okay. Uh, so time will pass. These are flowing past each other like this. All right, we'll stop it right here. That's going to see what's going to happen. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, and one. So uh, this is going to have a strong gradient to move an oxygen molecule in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and two. So we're going to have a strong gradient to move oxygen in here. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and three. Strong gradient to move oxygen into there. All right. These two things continue to flow past each other. The blood and the water. We'll stop it here. And we'll do that exercise one more time. What do we have? We have um, a gradient here, so um, an oxygen molecule can flow in. We have six and two, so an oxygen molecule can flow in. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and four, three, so we can have an oxygen molecule flow in. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and there are four over there, so it's still a strong gradient for water to flow into the cell or into the blood. Okay, so if we take a look at this, what have we done? Well, we have pulled oxygen out of the water as it passes through. And we can see that blood is slowly picking up more and more oxygen as it passes through the gills. So that's good. We want to extract, um, we want to extract oxygen from the water. Um, but remember, with co-current exchange, we eventually reached a point in which they were at equilibrium and we couldn't do any more work. The first thing you should notice is that that never happened here. Uh, so that's one important thing. We were always pulling oxygen from the water. Um, let's also take a look here then at the size of the gradient. So I've got one, two, three, four here and two here. If I do the simple math, four minus two, it's two, right? So there's a there's a gradient, the, the size of the gradient here is the arbitrary number of two or the number of oxygen molecules. Let's do it here too. Uh, one, two, three, three from five, two. All right, there's four here, six here, that's a difference of two. And there are seven here and five here, that's a difference of two. So the point of this is, is that at every point along the way, the magnitude of the gradient is essentially the same, which means we were the gradient's always going to favor the movement of oxygen from the water to the blood. Um, under these conditions, fish can extract extraordinary amounts of oxygen from, from the water, which is pretty important because uh, when you compare it to the concentration of oxygen in the air, there's, there's less water. There's less oxygen in water. And so um, being able to pull out as absolute much as you can uh, under, these scenario, under these conditions is really, really important. So this is why fish use countercurrent exchange in their gills.